Story 1. The tall, gloomy hall, adorned with woven tapestries depicting moments of heroic legends and various victorious battle scenes, could not alleviate his loneliness. The carved fireplace with barely glowing embers failed to warm his frozen limbs. The sparse furniture, appearing small and almost unreal, only added to the sense of desolation and abandonment. He despised this hall. Why then had he been sitting here for five hours straight when he could have left this cold and gloomy refuge long ago? As soon as the heavy creaking door adorned with intricate carvings and twists opened and the girl with chestnut curls and a mischievous face dashed in, the heiress to all conceivable and inconceivable riches, both magical and physical. Selina, the last of the line of white fire mages. She could have been a good wife and mother to his children, but she drenched him in contempt. Her anger and hatred pelted him from head to toe like hail. He had the right to feel beaten, humiliated, and practically destroyed, at least until the sun set. Then his powerful paws would carry the huge, shaggy beast to the limits of his domain, to freedom, to the moon, to uncharted paths. Perhaps history is right. This is the only love available to him, the only joy that won't reject or deceive him, the only loyalty he can count on. A persistent image spins in his mind's eye, a small round woman with a doughy face, squinty eyes and plump lips resembling a fancy pastry, sinking into a deep armchair, shrieking something about destiny and necessity. The end of her tirade is lost in a deep, guttural cough, which the gentleman sitting across from her tries to mask with a contemptuous laugh. Where this scene comes from and what it means now, he can't recall. But it disturbs and awakens his dozing consciousness. If he focuses on this scene, it becomes clear that it's not a fictional image, but a memory. Of course. There he is, a ten-year-old boy in a satin suit standing, hiding behind heavy curtains. His outfit is so overloaded with ruffles, bows, ties, and buttons that he resembles a wedding cake. The image of a caramelized sugar man is completed by his meticulously combed, curled, and pomaded dark blonde hair. He was terribly annoyed by what they did to him every morning, but he didn't dare argue. He shouldn't have been there. He ended up there by accident. He ran into the library, escaping another decoration concocted by some nanny. For some reason, they all thought that adorning him this way would bring pleasure to his parents' faces. However, his father only frowned, and his mother sighed heavily and sent him back to the nursery to change. You need to have a serious talk with her. He heard his father's words just as he was about to leave. And if she doesn't listen again, dismiss her. I can't just throw her out. The end of his mother's sentence was drowned out by the closing door. That's how he understood that there was some discord between his parents. His father was displeased. And that displeasure was caused by him. When the nanny found out why the young lord had returned, she threw up her hands and was offended, as if it were his fault that her efforts went unappreciated. This time, too, they sent him to change, but he hid here and fell asleep, exhausted from the tugging, running, and the nanny's constant whining and grumbling. Hearing voices, he woke up instantly, and while he was thinking about what to do, it was already too late to come out. Well, what can we do, dear? Individual phrases spoken in a languid, syrupy voice resurfaced in his memory. We warned Lilia, but she was always willful. I would even say, impossibly stubborn. She wanted to have a boy. And what are we to do with this child now? Hector, she called out petulantly, spilling out of the armchair like dough from a pot. Hector, do you hear me? Soon it will manifest, and what will we do? She emphasized the word, it. He emerged from the depths of memory, responding to a demanding call. 
The rustling of starched skirts resounded in the hall's silence like a stormy squall. The time when it sounded cozy, like the sound of a gentle summer rain, had passed. Couldn't you wait? A sharp, angry voice echoed. It cut through the air like a knife through resisting flesh. He would have liked to resist, but there was no chance. Lying is my middle name, isn't it? Mother? A bitterness and irritation seeped through his even, colorless voice. A tall, thin woman with a hawk-like face annoyed, shrugged, and moved to the window trying to make out something in the approaching twilight. Long, fluffy eyelashes framing her steel-gray eyes were the only remnants of her lost gentleness. If she could, she would turn them into steel spikes. I want this all to end just as much as you do, she said with barely noticeable weariness. Her thin lips twisted in an attempt to suppress a sigh. What is it? Turning away from the window, she looked at him with a haughty gaze, as if trying to read some hidden message he deliberately concealed behind a simple question, and was already preemptively trying to catch him in impudence or disrespect, or something else. Her mind had a rich arsenal of reproaches. Yet once, it was different. She smiled more often. Her light gray eyes, clear and expressive, looked at the world with wonder and interest. He inherited her gaze. His eyes were the same shade. In the moment when he looked at her intently, she seemed to see her own reflection in the mirror. He resembled her, the same proud profile, narrow face, broad cheekbones, only significantly paler than hers. The massive, wide forehead was from his father, which until recently had been hidden under a lush hairstyle. Now his hair was cut short, and nothing distracted from his intelligent face. She was proud of her tall and handsome son, despite everything. You just had to wait, to endure until the ceremony. Then do as you wish. You mean to say that everything will end with the ceremony? His voice carried sarcasm. I thought that's where it all begins. Long fingers gripped the wooden armrests of the chair tightly. The man stood up sharply and approached the window. They stood side by side. It was now clear that they were almost the same height, but not because he was short, rather because she was incredibly tall. She turned and scrutinized her son's profile with a sharp gaze, barely restraining the desire to hug him, to tilt his head toward her, to melt the ice in his eyes with kisses, to make him laugh, to laugh as he used to, unrestrained and infectious. But the fear of stepping out of the role she had assumed long ago held back the impulse. She allowed herself only a slight hint of affection, barely touching his hand with her cold, thin fingers, lightly gripping the fabric of his sleeve. Richard. A wary look met her face. There was a hint of surprise in it, understandably. His mother's voice carried a forgotten tenderness. For a moment, he felt that time had turned back, and before him was the old Lalia, whom he had gazed at with undisguised admiration and adoration first from the cradle, then from a child's chair, and finally from a hard school bench. Everything around him changed, himself, the setting, people, but the angle from which he always looked at his mother, upward, remained constant. This lasted until, until one moment, he became an adult. A second ago, he was still a child, concerned with childish thoughts and tasks, and suddenly everything changed beyond recognition. And most importantly, she changed, terribly and irreparably. Even now, he sometimes felt like a puppy thrown into an icy pool. Deep inside, that silent adoration still lingered, trying to break through from within. At times, it seemed that a little more and it would tear him apart, an unquenchable thirst for love and attention. But icy restraint, a perfect jailer, no warmth however strong could escape its control. He slightly pulled away and his mother's hand slid down his smooth sleeve without conveying the faintest hint of tenderness. 
You know, mother, sometimes I feel like you see me as nothing more than a breeding bull, not a son. His cold mockery struck harder than a whip, leaving invisible, bloody marks. With an effort of will, the woman suppressed a cry of anger. The desire to slap him dissolved in her clenched fists. She hissed quietly in pain. A drop of blood appeared on her nail. She deserved this. But how much longer must she bear this penance? She was tired, deadly tired. Once having shown willpower, she couldn't follow through. What to regret now? The unsaid words at the right moment. The undone actions when needed. Watching her son's slender figure fall into a chair like a tree broken by a storm, she turned away and quickly headed for the exit. Now, with her face hidden in the twilight, it twisted into a grimace of suffering. And again, he was alone. This conversation, like a slight disturbance on the smooth surface of a lake, briefly touched his feelings and then vanished as if it had never happened. A few seconds later, the image of the recent encounter faded from his memory, like an artist washing off an incorrect and clumsy sketch from the canvas. A sketch. That's what it was. This conversation had no meaning since it would have no consequences. Such conversations had happened every time for several years since this idea emerged. However, it was too early to reproach it for absurdity. Perhaps something would come of it. His mother had always succeeded in achieving what she wanted. Do you judge me too, Hector? From the shadowed wall, like a veil, a short figure emerged. The person approached the chair, and in the faint evening light, filtering through the high-pointed stained glass windows, a sturdy man with large hands and feet was revealed. He was no longer young. Silver streaked his short hair and bushy mustache. No, my lord, I only regret another lost opportunity. His eyes, an unusual violet color among humans with vertical cat-like pupils, looked calm and slightly sad, though his lips smiled. You know what troubles your mother. A faceless gray servant slipped in through the door, following a barely noticeable nod, placed a tray with a decanter and two goblets on the table, and disappeared as quickly as he had appeared, as if melting into the twilight. Yes, sighed Richard heavily, accepting the goblet filled with a thick blood-red drink from his mentor. Thank you. There's only one thing I can't understand. And if a boy is born... Again. He glanced inquisitively at Hector standing beside him. If it happens again... The history of my family has shown that a woman's wish also carries weight. What then, huh? Will they drown him, hang him, strangle him right in the womb, killing the unsuspecting mother along with him? Do you really want me to be part of that? What horrors come to your mind, my lord? Came the restrained response. Your mother is not a monster, just like the rest. Richard. Catching the unspoken thought, smirked. You mean to say that despite everything they raised me? I think they already regret it. I caused too much trouble. And mother? He bit his lip, as if catching a sharp remark ready to escape, and didn't continue. Listen, he perked up. Let's go for a walk, to the west. Maybe the wind will clear the clouds and we'll make it by sunset. You know how it is this time of year. Something suddenly cheerful appeared in Richard's face, in his entire figure. He jumped up as if shaking off the gloom and cold weighing him down. A light flush appeared on his cheeks, and his eyes sparkled with anticipation of adventure. Boy, thought Hector, and aloud he remarked, It's quite a distance on two legs. So, on four, smiled Richard. The smile was such a rare guest on his protege's face that Hector's heart involuntarily contracted with a strange, aching feeling. Maybe we should think about cloaks, the mentor suggested. Mischief sparkled in his eyes like little golden fish. Then let's go. The wolves ran side by side, paw to paw, nose to nose, glancing at each other and around. 
but without turning their heads, just slightly shifting their eyes to the side. By nature, they had an excellent sense of smell, and turning their heads was unnecessary. Casting a keen, steady gaze on the road ahead, they saw the white plain of the wide valley, covered with recently fallen snow. Their tracks were the first to decorate the natural canvas with a mysterious script, unfamiliar even to seasoned hunters. Though they were much heavier and larger than ordinary wolves, their prints were barely noticeable and were quickly covered by a light drift, veiling the cuneiform with a snowy shroud. So you are a werewolf? Does that scare you? I didn't have time to be scared and now I simply can't afford it. You saved my life, again. In fact, nothing very dangerous was threatening you, Aglaia. My transformation was more an instinctual response to danger in general, rather than something truly serious in this case. She stared at him intently, as if expecting a wolf's snout to emerge from behind his human face. This explains a lot, she said thoughtfully, finally turning her attention to the plate in front of her. Richard exhaled carefully. Her gaze had burned across his face, and a sheen of sweat covered his forehead. An unbearable childlike desire to crawl under the table seized him. What exactly? he asked with effort. His voice was detached and indifferent, contrary to the anxiety washing over him. He didn't know how to act or what to say. In fact, he never did. When her gray, glass-clear eyes turned toward him, he would get flustered, struggling to gather his thoughts and find the right words. Her gaze seemed to place shackles on his mind, and at those moments he felt slow-witted and dim. It wouldn't have been surprising if she thought the same. He had often tried to find confirmation of his expectations in her attitude toward him, in her words, but her behavior was always quite ordinary. Calm friendliness was present in her voice and demeanor. Aglaia was grateful for her rescue, that was natural. She showed her gratitude in what she thought he expected from her. Aglaia thoughtfully played with her food, as if she hadn't heard his question. Then she looked up and cautiously asked, Would you be offended if I asked you a question? You don't have to answer if you don't want to but I would really like to know. She wrinkled her nose cutely and glanced at him slyly from under her eyebrows. In that moment, she was unbearably charming. What do you want to know? He smiled, instantly forgetting the doubts and shyness that had plagued him just moments ago. How old are you? Richard choked and coughed in surprise, as he had least expected such a question after her cautious prelude. Forty? he replied, when he could breathe freely again. I apologize. Her thin, reddish eyebrows arched in surprise. You look so young. But that age can hardly be called old, can it? Richard clarified cheerfully. He was finding this conversation increasingly amusing. For the first time since her arrival at the house, he wanted to talk, and talk honestly. Of course. Aglaia blushed. I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to say, or rather, not how I meant to ask. I understand. You see, werewolves have their advantages, too. He experienced immense and incomparable pleasure observing her embarrassment. This embarrassment made her lower her eyes, allowing him to scrutinize her features shamelessly. Many women would consider such advantages a great gift, she remarked coquettishly glancing quickly at the table. What kind of gift? More like an inevitable burden. She opened her eyes wide in surprise, hearing the involuntary bitterness in his voice. Such words required an explanation. You see, Aglaia, a werewolf's abilities are a kind of mutation. They have their positive and negative sides. For example, tell me. Do you really need to know? Yes, but I think you want to tell me too. The last phrase slipped out unexpectedly, on its own accord. Aglaia blushed again. She couldn't understand what made her say those words, 
She wasn't well-versed in psychology. Common sense should have kept her tongue in check and prevented her from angering the master of the house. After all, she still didn't know where this house was and how to get out of it. But she didn't really want to leave anymore. A mystery loomed on the horizon, and she loved all kinds of puzzles. And the master of the castle reminded her more of a medieval knight, with some incomprehensible codes, rather than a modern man. That, too, required understanding. Aglaya was a romantic girl, though she tried her best to hide it from herself and her acquaintances. She explained her passion for romance and gothic literature simply as a curiosity. In reality, her head was filled with a jumble of notions, motives, desires, and aspirations, partly drawn from movies, partly snatched from books. Not always quality books, but she was satisfied with them. She saw that she was being scrutinized shamelessly, but for some reason couldn't respond with a bold look or an angry remark, anything that could stop this embarrassing examination. She sharply felt how the roles had changed. Now she was being studied. Aglaya realized with surprise that she even found this scrutiny somewhat pleasant. Just a little, just a bit. She straightened slightly, as if to sit more comfortably, unconsciously demonstrating the grace of her slender, flexible figure. Her hands gently placed the cutlery beside the empty plate and then lowered smoothly onto her lap. Richard was surprised again. Perhaps she was right. He did want to tell her everything and see how she would react. All previous listeners had fled headlong. He was suddenly filled with a competitive interest. Could he tell his story in a way that would keep her, if not next to him, then at least in the castle? Only in her presence did he suddenly realize that the cook was quite good, and the aged wine had a much stronger effect than he had previously thought. All these surprising metamorphoses required understanding. You see, a werewolf is quite a rare type of mutation. More often there are manifestations of other obvious magical abilities. For example, I'm quite sure that you don't even suspect that besides me, Hector, and the servants you know and have met, my mother also lives in the castle. And some other people you know nothing about. It's as if they are not here. This is a manifestation of one of the magical abilities, concealment, or the ability to become invisible. Not that they dissolve into thin air? No. Simply put, if my mother wishes, you could walk beside her all day and never know that you are being watched. You wouldn't hear, feel, or bump into anything that would allow you to discover her. It's a very convenient trait, in demand in certain professions. There are magical abilities that allow you to feel plants, control fire or water, and many others. Our mages have a wide variety of skills. Werewolves look rather poor by comparison. I can't create fire with a wave of my hand. I can't move objects with my mind. I can't develop enormous speed. And although as a wolf I am stronger and more enduring than many, I have more limitations than all the others. How so? First of all, animals and humans have different lifespans. Transforming into a human doesn't stop the wolf's life cycle. It just slows it down. Some of the wolf's abilities remain when I am a human, like reaction speed or strength. What I mean is, when I am human, I am still a bit of a wolf too. There is always a chance that transforming into a wolf, I won't be able to turn back, because my wolf's life will end. I will simply die. And that's all. In families where there are werewolves, this scares the relatives the most. Neither you nor those around you know when this will happen. Of course, it is partially possible to track this. You suddenly realize that in the wolf form it takes more effort to do things that used to be easy. But there are always other explanations for this, and few remember everything that happened to them in wolf form. Only separate moments, and even then, vaguely. 
To retain memory or part of consciousness during transformation usually requires long and persistent training. It's best if these are conducted under the guidance of an experienced person, possibly someone who has already subdued their changing nature or someone who has studied werewolves extensively. But I must tell you that no amount of study from the outside will describe everything as it truly is. It won't tell the whole truth. Moreover, the animal essence has its demands when you are in a wolf's skin, he smirked. For example, it is hard to resist the call of blood. In my case, a wolf is a predator. Chasing prey is its life. I can control the wolf to a certain point, but if it senses prey, its fear, and blood, control becomes problematic. Are there different kinds of animals among you? mostly predators, and their lifespan is not long. Could you kill someone, a loved one? He looked at her strangely from under his brows and bent lower over his plate. I said problematic, not impossible, came his muffled response. In that moment, Richard suddenly felt tired. The recent willingness to talk openly vanished, replaced by a mixture of amazement and hatred. He couldn't understand what had caused such a desire in him. A man who generally disliked talking about himself, let alone explaining anything to someone else. A stranger. He looked at the woman sitting opposite with dislike and couldn't comprehend his recent sympathy. Now everything about her seemed too bright, blinding his tired eyes. The white skin of her face and hands, which had once shone like the moon, now had a ghostly, lifeless gleam and repelled rather than attracted. She had undergone a crushing metamorphosis. He had never seen anything like it. A simple and honest thought was trying to break through at the back of his mind, but he wouldn't let it. The thought was that none of his previous interlocutors had ever said such a phrase. They had practically said nothing at all because they ran away earlier. Out of fear and hatred. They were afraid he would attack them right then and there, sinking his teeth into their soft, pliable human throats. Too many scary rumors circulated about werewolves. No one sorted out which of these rumors were true and which were fiction. He was the only one who dared to do so, and only because he had no choice. He tried to pull himself together, realizing that perhaps the changes had not happened to her. But something had happened to him at that very moment. He stared at his hands as if expecting to see wolf paws instead, and at the same moment felt the wave of transformation coming over him. His breathing quickened, his forehead broke out in sweat. His frightened mind began to race, silently calling for help, and help came. He heard the voice that could always calm him. Richard, are you all right? Attentive violet eyes looked at him kindly and insistently, and a mental message penetrated his consciousness. Hector was sharing his strength to help him regain control. After a few moments, his breathing steadied, and Richard gratefully shook the hand holding his wrist. Yes, Hector, I'm fine, thank you. He stood up carefully, slowly and lazily folding the napkin and dropping it onto the table. It seems we will have to postpone our conversation for another time. Aglaya, he managed to say her name with difficulty. It was like a needle piercing his heart when he heard it from his own lips. I apologize, he said politely, slightly bowing his head, though he wanted nothing less than to be gallant. He turned slowly and, accompanied by Hector, exited through the door. And there, just as the heavy doors closed behind him, it hit him. A picture so vivid and real appeared before his eyes that he involuntarily reached out to touch it. His nostrils flared, sensing the approaching wave of scent. His consciousness convulsed and faded. A step. Another. How painful it was to walk. It would be so much easier to get on all fours and break free from this circle. But a soft, 
insistent voice cut through the tangle of ancient instincts. It tore them to shreds. Along with them, his veins burst and blood fell to the floor in large drops. Blood. Drops. His nostrils flared, catching the scent. His body was tearing into thousands of pieces. His veins throbbed and burst, and blood covered everything around. Those few yards to his bedroom felt like two or three hours, as he fought with all his might against the transformation that was crushing, twisting, and mangling him. But the quiet, confident, and reassuring voice he clung to led him forward. A step, another. He struggled through the instincts demanding his submission. He did not want to submit, not now. The viscous sludge wrapped around his legs, preventing movement. It sucked him in, stifling his breath. Finally, he made it. He collapsed. His lips touched something hard. His teeth clattered against the edge of the bowl, spilling its contents, and his white shirt turned red. Blood. He ground his teeth in rage, pushing away the unknown something that was supposed to help but didn't. He jerked and fell back, hitting his head. Wild pain splashed across his face in circles with scarlet streaks, and darkness fell. Darkness and peace. How is he? Hector turned sharply from the door, hearing an unusually high, almost squeaky voice. My lady, he bowed his head showing respect to the mistress of the house. How is he? She finally managed to control her voice, suppressing sobs, burying them deep inside where no one would see. But her traitorous voice almost gave her away. All the agony she endured listening to the wild screams coming from behind the thick door. Behind the door, the terrible torment of transformation tore at her son's body. And he resisted. He's fine now. He's sleeping. Hector approached. A beam of the setting sun penetrated through the slightly open curtains and illuminated the wet path on his cheek. He made it, my lady. For a moment, Lilia lost control. Her legs gave way and she slid down the wall. He... He's sleeping, she repeated, as if tasting the words. She rolled each letter on her tongue and swallowed it along with her composure. Lalia ran her thin, long fingers through her high hairstyle and jerked her head violently. After standing for a moment, Hector carefully sat down next to her, leaning against the cold stone wall, not feeling the chill. Rifia was a dear child. She started walking before she could talk, so she didn't communicate her desires with cries or the usual baby cooing. She simply went where she wanted exploring every interesting place, often sending her caretakers into a frenzy searching for her. She loved everyone, but most of all her brother. He was ten years older and likely seemed almost omnipotent to her. For a long time, he was burdened by her constant presence as she interfered with his serious affairs, clinging to his clothes and following him everywhere. No matter how hard he tried to get rid of her, it never worked. At first his playmates laughed at him, then they got used to it. When they asked where his tail was, he felt mocked, and everything inside him bristled with resentment toward the silly little girl who constantly exposed him to the barbs of cruel words. Gradually his friends understood what made him wince, why his gaze filled with a chilling darkness and later with uncontrolled and menacing hatred. The harmless jabs, which were not inherently offensive, ceased. But he did not forget them. He found in them justification for his failures, which happened to him as they did to any boy his age. These were failures in understanding his body's capabilities, his strength. All things learned through hundreds of repetitions and training, but he wanted it all at once and he believed that his hatred, brought to light by the mockery, hindered him from achieving everything immediately. From such thoughts, it was a short step to realizing who was the cause of this mockery. Rifia. He tried to avoid her, but the girl found him everywhere, 
seemingly appearing at the most inopportune moments. His mother added fuel to the fire by behaving strangely, as if trying to protect the girl from her brother. Yet he had never even touched her, not even once. He hadn't even flicked her nose. He hates me, she said in a muffled voice. Hector, distracted from his thoughts, looked at the clear profile of the woman sitting next to him. She was beautiful. Age and hardships had left their marks, but not prominently. Like light wrinkles around the eyes and sorrowful lines at the corners of her mouth, visible through a translucent veil. The expression of weariness made them more pronounced. Her eyes, steel gray and cold, seemed softened by the veil of tears, making them appear warmer. Did she have to suffer and cry now to reveal the best qualities that once made her future husband lose his head? Lalia, he allowed himself to call her by name. Half turning, he gently covered her hand, lying limply on the floor with his large, strong fingers. A son cannot hate his mother. She glanced sideways, a smirk touching her lips. Unless the mother has done something to be hated for. Her voice suddenly rang with steel, as if she was about to cut open her chest with words. She resolutely pulled her hand out of his warm fingers, stood up. Straightening her dress, she headed for the stairs, away from the room where she had spent several bitter hours, trembling and listening to the sounds coming from behind the door. She stopped abruptly, hearing a soft call but did not turn around. Lalia. Hector looked at the departing woman's back. He couldn't let her leave like this, without trying to offer some comfort. Understanding that the main comfort must come from mother and son. Lalia, I don't know anything your son could hate you for. Nothing he couldn't understand and forgive. You need to share your pain and fears with him. Richard is your son. He loves you, despite everything. She listened. Her shoulders drooped. The simple home dress rustled faintly with each step. Hector watched the departing woman and his heart ached for both of them. Story 2 In the dimly lit sanctuary of my study I faced the torment of my own creation. A writer's worst nightmare had me firmly in its grasp. The dreaded writer's block. My name is Kevin Stanley and I have spent years weaving tales of terror and horror, but now I found myself entangled in a web of my own making. Outside my study window, the world carried on oblivious to my turmoil. The incessant tapping of the keyboard echoed through the room, each keystroke a reminder of my inability to conjure the next chapter of my popular horror series. My publisher's relentless demands for a faster delivery had become the vultures circling over my creative corpse. I gazed at the shelves that lined my study, my eyes skimming over the spine of every classic horror novel. The ghosts of literary giants seemed to taunt me, their works a testament to the heights of terror that I once effortlessly scaled. Now. I stood at the precipice of a seemingly insurmountable writer's block, unable to take the next step into the abyss. My friend Bill Verdon, a fellow writer with a penchant for the macabre, had sensed my desperation. Over a late-night whiskey, he whispered of a place that had ignited a spark of curiosity within me, a spark that I hoped would be the key to unlocking my creativity. Bill spoke of an abandoned mansion, a decaying relic on the outskirts of town. This mansion had a history steeped in darkness and tragedy. It was once owned by a meat magnate named Chester, a man of wealth and privilege. He shared this opulent home with his wife and two children, a boy and a girl. Their lives had been a picture of happiness until a deadly disease ravaged the state, a plague carried by the tainted meat Chester sold. It led to his financial ruin, turning the mansion into a haunting reminder of his fall from grace. In the depths of despair, 
Chester had committed a heinous act, one that defied reason and humanity. He had taken the lives of his beloved family, their blood staining the walls of the mansion. In a final act of madness, he had turned the gun on himself, ending his torment and sealing the mansion's grim fate. Since that day, the mansion had stood abandoned, a spectral monument to a family's tragedy. But as with any place steeped in darkness, rumors and legends had taken root. Whispers spoke of a curse, a malevolent force that dwelled within the mansion's crumbling walls. Those who ventured inside were said to vanish without a trace, swallowed by the same abyss that had consumed Chester and his family. As Bill recounted these chilling tales, my skepticism wavered. Years of immersing myself in the darkest recesses of human psychology had left me desensitized to superstitions. I had explored haunted asylums, wandered through forgotten graveyards, and spent nights in the most ominous of places without encountering anything beyond the bounds of reality. Yet the story of Chester's mansion had kindled a peculiar fascination within me a perverse curiosity that danced with the embers of my dormant creativity. It was an opportunity to confront the supernatural firsthand, to embrace the legends and rumors that had clung to the mansion like a shroud. Perhaps within its shadowed chambers, I would find the inspiration I so desperately sought. The journey to the mansion had been long, stretching across two days of winding roads and overgrown paths, that led to the small town nestled amidst the dense forest. The sun hung high in the noonday sky when I finally arrived, my car parked in front of the looming edifice. The mansion, with its grandeur and history, loomed before me, a haunting beauty that defied time and decay. I stepped out of my car, my eyes tracing the intricate details of the mansion's facade. It was a structure that had once been a testament to opulence, a symbol of a family's prosperity and happiness. Now it stood as a melancholic relic, its windows shattered and boarded up, its walls bearing the weight of neglect. Despite the ominous aura that clung to the mansion, I felt an undeniable sense of awe. The mansion's size and beauty were undeniable and I couldn't help but be captivated by the haunting allure of its architecture. I didn't rush inside right away. Instead, I decided to explore the abandoned courtyard and garden that had once been a source of joy and serenity. As I entered the garden, a profound sadness washed over me. The passage of time had been unkind to this once vibrant place. The fountain, which had once glistened with crystal-clear water, now lay dormant and broken, a casualty of neglect. The brick paths, once meticulously maintained, had succumbed to the relentless march of nature, their surfaces marred by cracks and weeds pushing through the gaps. The garden, once teeming with life and color, was now a wilderness of overgrown bushes and unruly weeds. It was a stark reminder of the passage of time, a testament to the mansion's descent into desolation. My footsteps crunched on the dry leaves and brittle branches that littered the ground as I ventured deeper into the garden's heart. Amidst the tangle of greenery, I stumbled upon an old swing, its chains rusted and creaking with age. Nearby, an ancient deflated leather ball lay forgotten, a relic of happier days. I couldn't help but imagine the laughter of children that had once filled the air, the echoes of their joy now silenced by the passage of years. With a heavy heart, I left the garden behind and made my way to the mansion's entrance. The crumbling facade gave way to a dusty interior where the echoes of a bygone era still lingered. The floors bore the scars of time, their surfaces covered in a thick layer of dirt and dust. Some rooms were in a state of disrepair, their furniture broken and strewn haphazardly about. Evidence of recent visitors was scattered throughout the mansion. Traces of a fire lingered in one corner, 
cigarette butts and wrappers from various fast foods scattered about. It seemed that homeless individuals or adventurous students had occasionally sought refuge within these haunted walls, their presence leaving behind tangible reminders. I continued down the dimly lit hallway, my footsteps echoing through the mansion's abandoned chambers. The eerie stillness of the place hung in the air, broken only by the faint creaking of the old floorboards beneath my feet. The mansion whispered tales of its own, each room a canvas upon which stories of love, despair, and tragedy had been painted. Another horror story began to take shape in my imagination, and the mansion itself became a character in the narrative I was creating. I couldn't wait to settle down in one of the abandoned rooms, to let inspiration overwhelm me, and I opened my laptop to breathe life into the chilling story that was slowly unfolding before me. The mansion's interior was a labyrinth of grandeur and decay, far larger than it had appeared from the outside. I wandered through its echoing hallways, my mind consumed by thoughts of the horror novel that was slowly taking shape in my imagination. I had lost track of time and distance, and it was only when I reached the far end of the third-floor corridor that I realized how far I had ventured. My attention was drawn to a closed door, standing alone in the dimly lit hallway. It struck me as peculiar, for most of the mansion's rooms had been left open to the ravages of time. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the door, my hand reaching out to turn the tarnished doorknob. To my surprise, the door refused to yield. I tried several more times, but it remained steadfastly closed. Frustration welled within me, but I decided to leave my attempts for the moment. There was the matter of a mattress to attend to, one I had left in my car, intending to spend the night within the mansion's eerie confines. As I turned away from the enigmatic door, I was struck by an eerie sensation, a sensation that sent a shiver down my spine. The silence of the mansion was shattered by the distinct sound of creaking wood, my heart raced, and I turned sharply to face the source of the sound. My breath caught in my throat as I saw the door to the mysterious room swinging open of its own accord. A soft yellow light spilled out into the hallway, casting long, distorted shadows across the faded wallpaper. Fear gripped me, and I swallowed hard, my throat dry and constricted. Intrigued and unnerved in equal measure, I couldn't resist the pull of curiosity. I approached the room cautiously, my footsteps barely audible on the aged floorboards. I peered through the doorway, my eyes widening in surprise and confusion. Inside the room, there were two neatly made beds, each adorned with pristine, folded baby clothes. One set of clothing was clearly for a boy, while the other was for a girl. The room was unlike any other in the mansion. It was immaculate, untouched by the ravages of time. There was no dust, no dirt, and all the furniture stood intact. It was as though this room had been carefully maintained and watched over, a stark contrast to the decrepit state of the rest of the mansion. A wave of unease washed over me, and I felt a cold sweat bead on my forehead. I decided it was best to leave the room unattended. I took a hesitant step backward and stepped away from the doorway. I wanted to separate myself from this strange room. I quickened my pace, and my footsteps echoed in the hallway as I moved farther and farther away from the strange children's room. Yet no matter how far I walked, the sense of unease clung to me like a shadow. I pushed aside the unsettling thoughts that had begun to gnaw at me and attempted to focus on the one thing that had brought me here, the need to find inspiration for my novel. I needed to start writing, to delve into the dark recesses of my imagination and bring my story to life. But then, the ominous creaking of the door shattered my concentration once more. My heart raced as I turned around to see the door swinging open yet again. How was this possible? 
I had distanced myself from that strange children's room, yet here I was, inexplicably drawn back to it. A growing sense of dread twisted my insides as I peered through the open door. The room lay before me, unchanged from when I had last seen it, a pristine tableau of neatly made beds and folded baby clothes. The eerie familiarity of the scene sent shivers down my spine, and I was tormented by questions that had no answers. I made a decision to retreat once more, to put as much distance as I could between myself and that baffling room. I started to walk briskly, and then, almost instinctively, I broke into a run. The hallway stretched endlessly before me, a labyrinthine maze that refused to yield an exit. No matter how fast or how far I ran, the corridor seemed to stretch on infinitely. The echoing sound of the door creaking behind me sent a shiver down my spine, and I dared to look over my shoulder. To my horror, the children's room had reappeared once again as though mocking my futile escape attempts. Panic gripped me, and my breath came in ragged gasps. This was beyond anything I had ever experienced in my life. I was confronted with a situation that defied all reason, a supernatural phenomenon that left me bewildered and terrified. I had always been a skeptic, a rationalist who scoffed at tales of the paranormal, but there was no denying the reality unfolding before me. With my mind clouded by fear and confusion, I resorted to desperate measures. I sprinted down the hallway, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. I needed to find an escape, a way out of this nightmare. My heart pounded in my chest as I searched for stairs that would lead me back to the ground floor. But no matter how far I ran, the corridor remained unyielding, stretching endlessly before me like a malevolent force. The door creaked open once more, and I turned to see the children's room, its presence an unrelenting specter that haunted my every step. Panic overwhelmed me, and I began to feel a suffocating sense of dread. I didn't know what to do next. I was trapped in a nightmarish loop with no apparent escape. It was a sensation of helplessness I had never experienced before. Desperation drove me to try the windows, but my efforts were in vain. Every window on the third floor of the mansion was boarded up, as if to seal off any hope of escape. I tugged and pulled at the boards with all my strength, but they remained firmly in place, as though the very mansion itself conspired to imprison me within its walls. The realization that I was trapped, at the mercy of forces beyond my understanding, sent a chill down my spine. I was no longer the master of my own fate, and the creeping terror of the unknown tightened its grip on my soul. Fear had taken firm hold of me, its icy fingers wrapping around my racing heart. I continued to sprint down the seemingly endless corridor, my eyes darting around frantically for any sign of escape. The oppressive sense of entrapment weighed on me, and every passing second seemed to stretch into eternity. I came to an abrupt stop, desperation driving me to find a solution to my predicament. I knew I couldn't enter that mysterious children's room, as an unshakable sense of foreboding warned me that something terrible lurked within. Instead, I needed to flee, to put as much distance as I could between myself and that sinister doorway. My thoughts raced, a frantic whirlwind of anxiety and panic. Then, as I scanned the floor, my eyes fell upon something that sent shivers down my spine. Among the footprints that belonged to me, my own boot prints, there were other prints, animal prints. They were fresh, as if some creature had been running alongside me on the third floor hallway. The realization struck me like a thunderbolt. I was not alone. There was something else here, something otherworldly, chasing me through the darkened corridors of the mansion. The fear that had already consumed me deepened, and I felt a chill crawl up my spine. As I stared at the animal tracks etched into the dusty floor, the sense of dread intensified. 
The tracks were unmistakably those of a dog, though unlike any dog I had ever encountered. I dared not linger too long on this unnerving discovery. The door to the children's room creaked open once more, breaking through my frantic thoughts. I turned to see the door swing wide, beckoning me toward it with an almost malevolent insistence. Without hesitation, I bolted away from the room, my footsteps echoing through the hallway as I ran. I ran with all the strength and endurance I could muster, my lungs burning with exertion, my thirst gnawing at my throat. I knew that if I stopped, if I allowed myself a moment's respite, I would find myself once again in the clutches of that accursed room. The minutes stretched into a torturous eternity as I pushed my body to its limits. I couldn't run indefinitely, and at last I was forced to stop. I leaned heavily against the cold, unforgiving wall, gasping for breath, my heart pounding like a drum. As I regained my composure, I realized that the floor beneath me bore more footprints, my own and those of the mysterious animal. It was as though the creature had been chasing me relentlessly, its presence an ominous shadow at my heels. The sheer terror of my situation threatened to overwhelm me once more. I was trapped in a nightmarish labyrinth, pursued by an entity I couldn't comprehend. The door to the children's room creaked open yet again. The open door leading to the children's room beckoned me once more, but something had drastically changed. The soft, yellow light that had previously bathed the room in an eerie glow had transformed into a menacing red. A sense of foreboding gripped me as I stood frozen in fear, my ragged breaths filling the tense silence. Despite the overwhelming dread, curiosity got the better of me, and I began to inch closer to the children's room. Every step I took felt like a leaden weight, and the heavy thud of my heart echoed in my ears. I approached the doorway and cautiously peered inside. What I saw within the room froze the blood in my veins. The walls, the floor, everything was covered in blood. The once neatly folded baby clothes lay strewn on the floor, soaked in crimson. The entire room seemed like a nightmarish canvas painted with the macabre hue of death. A horrified gasp escaped my lips, and I quickly covered my mouth to stifle the urge to vomit. As I stood there, paralyzed by the gruesome tableau before me, a sinister rustling sound filled the air. I turned my gaze to the dresser where a music box sat. Its lid had sprung open, and an ominous melody emanated from within the room, casting eerie notes into the hallway. I took a step back, my heart pounding, as the haunting music filled my ears and seemed to seep into my very soul. The room pulsed with malevolence, and I knew I had to escape its clutches once more. I turned and ran my footsteps echoing through the corridor as I put as much distance as possible between myself and the nightmarish nursery. But the music pursued me relentlessly, growing louder and more ominous with every step. It was as though the melody was playing inside my head, a cacophony of dread that threatened to consume me. Panic clawed at my chest, urging me to run faster to escape the haunting melody that pursued me like a relentless specter. My strength waned, and I stumbled, falling to the floor and striking my head painfully against the unforgiving surface. I fought to regain my composure, my breaths coming in ragged gasps as fear continued to grip me. I struggled to my knees, my body heavy with exhaustion and dread. As I raised my head, my eyes fell upon a door that stood not far from me. It was different, unlike any door I had seen on the third floor of the mansion before. With great effort, I managed to get to my feet and stagger toward the unfamiliar door that had appeared in the hallway. My trembling hand reached for the doorknob, and I turned it slowly. The moment I pushed the door ajar, 
the haunting melody that had pursued me throughout the mansion abruptly ceased. The sudden silence sent a shiver down my spine, and I instinctively recoiled. But as seconds passed, and nothing else happened, I summoned the courage to approach the door once more. With a deep breath, I pushed it open fully and cautiously peered into the room beyond. The darkness within was impenetrable, and I could see almost nothing. My eyes strained in the inky blackness, slowly adjusting to the lack of light. What I saw in that dimly lit room filled me with a profound sense of dread and sent goosebumps coursing across my skin. In the center of the room there lay a grotesque mound of clothing. Pants, jackets, boots, athletic sneakers, some worn and aged, others torn and tattered, were piled haphazardly upon one another. Backpacks and women's bags were strewn about, discarded as if in a frenzy. Yet it was not the sight of this nightmarish clothing mountain that horrified me the most. My gaze shifted, and I spotted a sinister presence intertwined with the discarded garments, human bones. They were piled alongside the clothes, skeletal remains of unknown individuals, their twisted limbs and grim remains a testament to the horror that had unfolded within this room. Despair clenched my heart as I realized the true nature of the chamber. It was a macabre crypt, a place where death had laid claim to the living. The room was a tomb of forgotten souls, a testament to the malevolent forces that held sway within the mansion's walls. Fear threatened to paralyze me, and I took a hesitant step back, my mind struggling to comprehend the horror before me. But there was no respite, no escape from the malevolent forces that pursued me. The darkness seemed to pulse with an unseen malevolence, and the air grew heavy with an oppressive presence. As I stood frozen in terror, I heard it, an unsettling rustling sound, accompanied by heavy, labored breathing. It emanated from behind me, a menacing whisper that sent a chill through my very soul. My heart pounded in my chest, and I slowly turned to face the source of this newfound dread. My heart pounded in my chest as I turned to face the source of the menacing growling and rustling behind me. What I saw froze me in terror, a sight so horrifying that it defied all reason. There, not far from me, in the dimly lit hallway, stood a monstrous beast. Its fur was as black as midnight, its claws and teeth gleaming with a malevolent hunger. Its eyes, a fiery crimson, bore into me with an intensity that sent a shiver down my spine. The creature grinned, baring its sharp, deadly teeth, and a low, guttural growl emanated from deep within its throat. It resembled a dog, but it was anything but ordinary. It was a grotesque, nightmarish incarnation of malevolence, its size and ferocity far beyond that of any natural creature. My instincts screamed at me to flee, to escape the impending doom that loomed before me. But my terror escalated as I realized that I was not alone in this surreal nightmare. A second creature, equally monstrous and fearsome, materialized behind me. It was a colossal beast with white fur, its claws and teeth as menacing as those of its ebony counterpart. It mirrored the black dog's snarling, teeth-bearing grin, and its red eyes gleamed with the same malevolent intent. I was surrounded, trapped in the claustrophobic space of a corridor with monsters with no way out. Panic overwhelmed me, and I backed away from the relentless onslaught of monstrous fangs. I clearly realized my grave mistake in underestimating the sinister reputation of this abandoned mansion. As the two nightmarish creatures closed in on me, my mind raced, desperately seeking a way out. The realization of my impending demise weighed heavily upon me, and I cursed myself for my curiosity and disbelief in the ominous rumors that had surrounded this place. In my final moments, a cruel twist of fate revealed the truth to me. 
As I looked upon the grotesque, grinning beasts, a memory flashed before my eyes. A faded photograph I had come across during my ill-fated exploration of the mansion. It depicted the family of the bankrupt tycoon, Chester, who had once called this place home. In the photograph, Chester, a portly man with dark hair, stood proudly outside the mansion, his blonde wife at his side. Next to them, their two children, a brunette boy and a blonde girl, smiled innocently. It was a portrait of happiness, now irrevocably tainted by the malevolent curse that had befallen them. With my fate sealed, I closed my eyes and accepted the grim reality that awaited me. The monstrous beasts drew nearer, their savage hunger ready to claim its final victim. And as their fangs descended upon me, my last thoughts were of regret, knowing that I had ventured too far into the realm of the supernatural. When darkness fell, I tipped the mug of cold coffee onto my laptop with a trembling hand. By this point, I was almost finished writing my novel. But I had to hurriedly interrupt my fantasy and search my backpack for napkins to wipe the coffee off the laptop keyboard. I sat alone in the dimly lit living room of Chester's old, decrepit mansion, the glow of my laptop screen illuminating my tired face. My novel was nearly complete, and all that remained was to write the ending, a fitting demise for the book's character. The morning light filtered in through the cracked windows, casting eerie shadows across the room. Exhaustion weighed heavily upon me, and I longed for the simple comforts of rest and a hot shower. Spending the night in this forsaken place had taken its toll, and I knew it was time to leave. I closed my laptop, drained the last remnants of cold coffee from my mug, and gathered my mattress preparing to make my escape. The mansion, though faded and worn, held a certain majestic beauty in the morning light, standing as a lonely sentinel in the midst of desolation. I paused for a moment, taking one last look at the imposing structure that had held me captive for the night. The mansion seemed very lonely. As I was saying goodbye to the mansion, a window on the third floor caught my eye. Shadows moved behind the cracked glass and my heart raced. I squinted, trying to see what I was seeing. Two figures, one a brunette boy and the other a blonde girl, appeared to be watching me from the window. Or at least, something that resembled children. Their gaze was fixed upon me, their presence sending a chill down my spine. Panic surged through me, and I quickly retreated to my car, the engine roaring to life. I sped away from the mansion, putting as much distance between myself and that accursed place as possible. The image of the children's spectral figures in the window haunted my thoughts. As I drove, the weight of my experiences settled upon me. I couldn't help but reflect on the choices I had made in pursuit of inspiration for my novels. It was time to put an end to these adventures, to prioritize my own well-being and sanity. The road lay ahead, and I couldn't help but think that I should get a good night's sleep first. <laughs>